So everyone, I am very honored and privileged. And I get butterflies every time I see Miss Kathy. Um, I absolutely love Miss Kathy. Um, she is someone who is really big in this space. But even though she's at all levels from local to national and on national levels, she is a person that brings sincere human perspective to this work as well as experience. Um, just being with her and being taken under her wing and learning more about the environmental space, I have learned so much. Um, and she's really shown me how to bring my heart to this work. And just being around her, being under her, learning from her um, is a treat. She is a fighter, um, but she doesn't throw hands. What she does is policy, connectivity, the work, and she brings a wealth of experience. Um, she has many accolades, many awards, but to me, she is just an amazing woman doing this work. So... I just want to introduce Miss Kathy. I love you, Miss Kathy. <laughs> Sorry, thank you so much. I was just talking and saying she's bringing tears to my eyes to hear this from the next generation of leaders because it really keeps me going and keeps me inspired. And she has no idea how much uh, she means to me and how much she keeps me inspired. Thank you. And first, uh, let me apologize to all of you. We all have busy schedules and I value everyone's time. Uh, this was the first day that we didn't have Zooms to where we could actually go out to lunch for a change rather than having all day Zooms and going out to dinner and, and coming home and passing out because uh, from exhaustion. So thank you so very much. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about me. I grew up uh, in the deep south of Mississippi uh, during segregation. And um, I always say I was born an activist. It wasn't like I had a choice when you're born and raised in the deep south of Mississippi. You are pretty much, much born in the movement. And I know that there are people, my elders <laughs> who are still around, who say they can recall me going to NAACP meetings when I was on my parents' lap. I don't remember as far back, but I do remember as far back as 10 years old uh, having an office in the NAACP and meeting people like Dr. Martin Luther King, who absolutely inspired me. It's very unfortunate that, you know, at that young age, you didn't think maybe you should take a picture with him. That might do you some good later on in life. <laughs> uh, but it was um, kind of normal for us to grow up meeting everyone. And sadly enough, it was also normal for us to endure bomb threats and cross burnings and death threats. Uh, to people we loved and people that we were uh, near. So I, I later became an educator. So I'm actually an advocate turned educator and being an educator was the absolute last thing on my radar. It never, it was not glamorous. It was not anything, but I did make a conscientious decision at a very early age. Um, I wanted to do something um, that I felt was uh, probably, you know, more exciting, more glamorous. Um, and then I had a much higher calling, a calling for um, human rights and social justice. And that was a moral calling uh, as I uh, look back on it. And so that was more important to me. I could have made a lot more money, but um, I was inspired to make much more of a difference. And uh, that's what I have tried in my lifetime to do to pay it forward to the people that I knew like Dr. Martin Luther King and Megra Evers and the one uh, death, uh, senseless death that me meant so much to me was that of Vernon Damer because um, who was the Forest County NAACP president uh, who was killed when his home and store was firebombed because as a child, long before I should have been learning how to drive, I learned to drive in the Keller Settlement area near his store and would go to his store every Saturday. So that one hit very close to home to me. Uh, and I continued my journey with human rights and civil rights uh, in the NAACP on a national level some 33 years ago when I was elected to what was then the National NAACP Board of Trustees. Uh, it's now the foundation board. 
and then I was elected to the National Board of Directors um, 23 years ago. Um, I have a sister who's an, an environmental scientist, and so I can tell you that I've always had an understanding of environmental and climate justice, um, but uh, it was an intellectual understanding. Um, I didn't have any advocacy. Um, I was very particular about the products that I use. Um, always um, engaged in uh, recycling and was really had this great level of consciousness. My actions just didn't follow. And it wasn't until Hurricane Katrina uh, came and literally blew my house down. Um, and actually the saddest part about Katrina, because I was able to rebuild my home, was that I lost two of my dearest friends to drowning death when the rapid waters of Hurricane Katrina came rushing into their homes and even climbing into their attics wasn't enough to save them. At that time, they stayed because we had so many calls. Everybody was running from storms and they were tired. And then they decided that their home had withstood Hurricane Camille, which had happened in 1969. And that had been the marker up until Katrina. If you're, you know, if you were able to, if your home withstood Hurricane Camille, everybody thought at that time that would be the worst that we've ever seen. But Hurricane Katrina proved a lot of people wrong. And one of our local media, meteorologists said one day that um, a lot of people died because of Hurricane Camille. And they, somebody tried to correct him and say, you meant Katrina. He said, no, I meant Camille because they used Camille um, as a false um, uh, guide to, you know, the future of hurricanes. And I think we've all witnessed that hurricanes have become more frequent and more intense since Hurricane Kat uh, Katrina. Uh, and I can tell you during Hurricane Katrina, it wasn't that I was looking at this on the news. Late at night, I had this little portable black and white television battery operated where I could see what was going on in New Orleans uh, very late at night, I could adjust the antennas and I would be able to see that. But I was actually living this every single day in Gulfport. I was living the failures of our government. I was living people in need of water and food and, and medicine and, and medical care. And just witnessing the miserable failures of our government and witnessing what I call, I remember very distinctly saying, I feel like I'm reliving Jim Crow all over because you, the, the differences in the haves and the have nots, uh, the differences in the injustices, the differences in the, the people who had access. Um, we were very fortunate in that we had uh, access, we had transportation, we had gas, we had a generator, we had food and water. But looking at all the people who didn't, and they didn't ha even have access, uh, the, the first responders or the relief agencies were located in areas that were inaccessible to people who didn't have transportation or who, who didn't have gas. And this changed the trajectory of my uh, civil and human rights advocacy uh, as it relates from the perspective of the NAACP. Now, the NAACP had had policy uh, on environmental and climate justice dating back to the late 60s and early 70s. But it wasn't until 12 years ago that we actually established a program department and largely due uh, to lack of funding, not due to a lack of interest. And I was asked to chair the um, inaugural committee for the environmental and climate justice for the NAACP National Board. And so I do a lot of work from there um, on a national, local, state, regional, national, and international level. However, I live on the Gulf of Mexico. I live with a few, just a few blocks, uh, about an eight to 10 minute walk from the Gulf of Mexico. And not long after Hurricane Katrina, five years to be exact after Hurricane Katrina, I could walk out my front door and within eight minutes, I'm looking at sludge from the BP oil spill. Um, you know, which just was another. So here I am, a survivor of the worst um, um, climate 
uh, catastrophe. And now I'm looking at the world's worst environmental catastrophe with the BP oil spill. If that weren't enough, um, out my back door about a year or so after the BP oil spill, um, there was a failing coal plant listed in the NAACP's cold blooded report that was less than four miles from my house out my back door. And um, by then, I don't know if you've ever heard of Tyler Perry's Don't Make a Black Woman Take Her Earrings Off. By this time, I had taken my earrings off. And I, you know, I had had enough. And I knew that my uh, intellect and my understanding, my actions had to match my intellect and my understanding. And I needed to make this my priority, not only for myself, as a matter of fact, least of all for myself, but for my children, my grandchildren and their children and the next generations to come. This is very important because I had the understanding, I just didn't have um, the motivation to act with the sense of urgency needed to deal with environmental and climate justice. And even now um, in, in the work from the international perspective, we look at things a lot of times from a policy perspective without taking people into mind. Uh, and one of the main things as we had COP26 in the UK, and one of the things that I had been uh, really upset about, and I'll, I'll back up a little and, and mention that um, my av advocacy and living in the Gulf region, um, that's a very special region as well, because I, I could go on and on with some of the false climate solutions like I'm a rate payer in the carbon capture sequestration area of the, um, of the Kemper County carbon capture sequestration plant, that big gigantic seven and a half billion dollar failure. Um, and um, it was put in a neighborhood of uh, overwhelmingly like about a 60, 70% African-American population with about a 50 plus percent poverty rate. And this is where they put all of these experimental type solutions. And now we're also looking at um, wood pellets manufacturing, the same thing in the Southeastern US states, most of the former slave states. And so what, what, what I see happening is that we are re-imperiling the same people who have been disproportionately impacted from environmental and climate justice as it relates to fossil fuel energy use, and we cannot keep re-sacrificing the same people. And because of the unique position and the fact that the Gulf region, which we often say is the sacrifice region, um, um, I was motivated to co-found a local grassroots organization, which is the Education, Economics, Environmental, Climate, and Health Organization, ECHO. And um, little did I know how intricately involved this local to global connection would be with the wood pellet manufacturers allowing these foreign based, mostly UK based plants to come into the Southeast, destroy our forests, causing our community, disproportionate BIPOC communities in order to ship wood pellets across the seas, across the ocean to be burned for energy and claiming to be a um, renewable energy source, something that is going to get us to 1.5. And the only problem is that it emits more carbon than coal. And I, I guess I'm being from the same state as Fannie Lou Hamer, when you hear I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of the same communities paying the price over and over again, it's just something that we cannot and we will not tolerate. And I think it's something that all of us have to be mindful of and we all have to look into these false solutions and be willing to stand up and say no more will we allow one particular segment of our society to disproportionately suffer all of these harms. And um, so this is a lot of the work that we've been doing because I knew that where I live, the location that I live in walking distance of the Gulf of Mexico, the state that's right in the center of the five Gulf states, that we had some unique challenges that we needed to address. So 
that's kind of the, a, a little niche in, in, in my frontline work because I, I know I, I'm in an organization that's a frontline organization and I'm at the top where there's a lot of bureaucracy and I do realize that. Uh, but and, and that was what prompted us to uh, start our own organization. And that's kind of an overview and I'm gonna stop there in case you have any questions. Thank you, Kathy, wow. You know, when I think about all the disasters that you went, the environmental disasters, Katrina, the, Bi the BP spill, the coal plant, on top of all the other um, uh, violence and hatred that you had experienced all the Jim Crow years. And I know a lot of people, especially after a disaster, just get knocked down. And it's hard for them then, they get just consumed in trying to survive. And so I'm wondering, you know, for yourself, um, how you found your resilience in the aftermath of that and or if there's something you have to say to other people who may be feeling like, you know, they can easily get knocked down and it's hard then to get themselves engaged in taking action. Oh, wow. Um, first of all, I, I think I'm just learning that you have to have time for self-care uh, because if you don't have self-care, it's a lot easier to get knocked down and probably a lot more difficult to get back up. Um, you know, there are times when I found, you know, okay, you, you just can't, you, you need a break. And um, I'm just learning to do that. Um, growing up, and, and I used to look back and say, you know, I don't know if we just felt that we were young and invincible, uh, or if we were actually intrepid, or just, just downright, you know, didn't know any better. And so um, I was scheduled to go to Paris for the signing of the, the negotiation for the Paris Climate Agreement. And then they had this bombing. And so everybody gets to texting me and calling and saying, well, you know, they just bombed Paris. You're not still going, are you? And I'm like, sure, why wouldn't I? <laughs> and it was at that moment that I realized it was probably a little of both, you know, it was probably feeling young and invincible. Um, uh, and, and surely a bit intrepid as well. And um, probably just knowing that this is something that we have to do. I, I don't think we have any other choice. We're talking about our planet and there is no planet B. We may have some um, wealthy people who are exploring other planet options. <laughs> But, you know, right now, this is the only planet we have. And um, even if they couldn't come up with some other planet alternatives, there will only be a very few people who will have the means to travel and live on another planet. So I don't think that we have any other choice. I'm, I'm hoping that everyone will go beyond. And that's why I will readily say that, yes, I had the understanding, but my actions just did not... Um, um, sync with the understanding, the level of understanding that I had that, look, we need to be out here and we need to be out doing something. Uh, so I do want to mention one thing that when we had, the, I mentioned about the failing coal plant. Uh, as soon as I found out about it, we started this campaign to educate people because I probably would not have known had I not chaired the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Committee if I had not had I had to read this report and it was like 478 page, uh, like 400 pages plus report. And I would not have known about this. And I said, look, we've got to start tr training and educating our community. And once we started this cold blooded campaign, people warned me, we were going up against a powerful industry. We would not win, you know, we were wasting our time. Oh. Yeah, you know, that's something you're telling uh, somebody who grew up as a child on the KKK threats. What do I care about a fossil fuel company? <laughs> so we were not in the least deterred. And I'm happy to report uh, that of August 2016, that plant no longer burns coal. Um, and uh, they tried everything that they could to divide and conquer us. Um, they took some people who were meter readers, put them in suits, 
dressed them up, had them to come, nice people had them to come and talk to us. And first thing they approached us about our report, they asked, uh, we hope you're not listening to that uh, play, racing class baby thing. We hope you're not listening to that, those people at the Sierra Club because they're just a bunch of rich white people who don't care anything about black people. They just care about birds and trees, which really, I, I mean, infuriated me that first of all, they want to infer, uh, they question why was the NAACP even involved in environment? You know, we were a civil rights organization. Why we, how, how did we venture into this? And then to me also implying that we did not have the capacity to come up with our own report. And um, so I quickly replied to them that I know what the CEO at the Sierra Club makes and I know what the CEO at the Southern Company makes, and I would decide which rich white man I wanted to listen to. So they never tried the race and class baiting with me again. Thank you, Kathy. Jen, you had a, a question. Well, I think my question really kind of parallels that that story you just told, and that is really, you know, uh, in all of your years as an activist and in your advocacy work, and specifically in your climate advocacy work, advocacy work, how have your strategies changed? What have you What have you learned in this work that maybe you can share that may be helpful as we're out there doing work? And and how how has how has the strategy changed over time? Oh boy, it, you know, there seems to be an, a different strategy uh, with, it, with every issue. I can tell you that net metering was the most difficult thing I've ever encountered in my 23 years with the, in, on the NAACP national level because the fossil fuel industry, their strategy, they've taken up pages out of the civil rights handbook. And so they know how to play this divide and conquer and pit race and, and, and class uh, against different races in class. And so uh, on the net metering, uh, they decided they would actually go into um, the same community constituents that we serve and say, listen, NAACP is wrong about this. You know, renewable energy is going to cost African-American and poor communities because you will be paying higher electricity costs because you won't be able to afford uh, renewable sources of energy such as wind and solar. So um, it's very easy when you're talking about jobs, people understand jobs, they understand the need to put food on the table and a roof over their head. So that's why talking about just transition, a just transition, and letting people know that we're, we're just as concerned about people being able to put food on the table and a roof over their heads, you know, acknowledge that because, you know, other than that, people are not going to trust, you know, the advocacy work, and they're really good at playing divide and conquer and, and doing that and talking about, you know, uh, uh, actually labeling environmentalists as job killers, uh, people who don't care about poor people in communities uh, when they are the ones. And, and they've even, um, I've testified before our Mississippi Public Service Commission and um, on net metering. And it was like the violins going, all of a sudden they are so concerned. And I've told them this, you, you have not been concerned about these same communities that you've been poisoning uh, with your coal plants, you know, for decades, for, for, for scores of years. Uh, but now all of a sudden, now that your profit is at stake, now all of a sudden you're concerned that they won't be able to afford electricity or the price of the grid. So I just say that, you know, people are very leery, but once they know that you are sincere and you sincerely, sincerely want to work and you are concerned all around, um, they will open their doors and hearts and, and trust. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. You know, I know that you've, uh, you're have you an elder now too. And, yes. and you talked about uh, how, you know, thanking the elders who led the way for you and helped you to learn, you know, sitting, sitting on your parents' lap at those meetings when you were so young. And so um, 
we're curious about what's most important to you as an elder in your climate work. And, and I think about how, just like those elders um, led the way for you, that all of us are here to lead the way for the younger generations. And, and so I'm curious about how that uh, plays into your work. Um, I, I think actually, and Anika mentioned, I, it just comes naturally to me because I want to infuse whatever little knowledge I have. I want to share it and I want to mentor as many young people, you know, as I can because they are inheriting what we're going to, to, to leave. And um, I, I honestly, I, I think as far back as I can remember, uh, I've always wanted to be able to leave this world better than I found it. it it's not, it, it sounds, you know, uh, pretty, pretty Pollyannish, but, um, and, um, and at the same time, um, um, it's, a, it's a great task. It, it's, it's a pretty great commitment as well. And I think that um, it, it's very important that um, we try to work together uh, across generations because we have a lot that we can learn from each other. Thank you, thank you. Nico, do you wanna uh, finish us up here with our appreciations? Yes, um, and I, first off, thank you, Ms. Kathy, for being here today. Um, Thank you. Um, you don't know what it means to me. And I can tell Brandy and Rev, you love me a little more now. Um, <laughs> um, but really, we thank you for being here today, being able to have this conversation about how you turned your understanding of what was going on in the world into action. Um, and I thank all of you for being here today. I definitely want to honor you guys' time. Um, and just from hearing Miss Kathy's story, we just, I just want you all to take with you all and be mindful from this, from this series and taking with you, hearing everything over the last seven months, those commitments to communities, to your communities, to other communities across generational lines, across color lines, like just think about what you're willing to commit yourself to beyond what we've been talking about. How um, have these conversations inspired you to do work in your community? I hope that over the last seven months, you all have gotten something that has been something to move your heart and create a change agent within your spirit to do the work because the work is never done. Um, and I just, my heart is full. I'm grateful for being in the space with you all and having these conversations each and every month. And if there is nothing else, um, be on the lookout for the recording of this. And in the next month, look out for the workbook that will be coming out. Um, if there's nothing else, we thank you all for joining us and you all have a great night. And I'll just add one little closing piece, which is um, that, you know, to remind you all that ECA is an all volunteer organization and that we depend on our members to keep us vibrant, whether it's by getting involved and bringing your time and energy and skill to the organization by making a donation, however small or large you're able to make and um, by continuing to be activists. And so I hope that for all of you who wrote down what you're committing to in the coming year for your climate equity justice work, that you made a note of that to yourself and that you will uh, be able to stay on task with that and focus on that through the ups and downs of that work. And please, you know, if, if you're able to do things and make a difference, uh, you're doing something you've never done before, let ECA know what you're doing because you can help to inspire other people. We all need each other to keep going with this. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Kathy, for being here. Thank you, Nico and Jen, for your amazingness. <laughs>
And uh, for each one of you who've been part of this, it's really been uh, a joy for all of us who worked on this to uh, spend these times with you all. And have a safe and happy holiday season. Thank you. Ms. Margo, Ms. Sheila has something, I believe. Oh, Sheila, go for it. Thank you so much, Ms. Kathy, I love you. Um, I've been in several of your workshops. You have um, really made an a awesome impact in my life. Um, I wanted to drop in there um, grant opportunities in the Midwest region. Um, uh, the Midwest Building Decarbonization has funding. Um, I did drop that link. Um, if there's anyone in the Midwest, we need your help. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening.